Welcome to the Ryan Curry Reading Room. My name is Chris Shoemaker. I am the director here, and I am so excited to see all of you out here tonight as we celebrate another wonderful year of Five Towns, One Book. Um, it's a, a privilege to work with Cure and bring people together for inspiring conversations. Um, that inform and change our lives. So thank you for joining us here at the Riot Free Reading Room tonight. It is a my privilege to introduce um, Pam Bradman and Nicole Alafante from Cure, who will be taking over and uh, running the show. So thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, so I'm Nicole Alafante from Cure. We're the Coalition for Understanding Racism Through Education. We were founded in about 2018. We are in Larchmont and Maranek, but we've had the great honor of um, making lots of relationships throughout the county at this point. And so we're grateful to be here. The uh, Westchester County Board of Legislatures funds this particular event. Um, and we want to shout out to Catherine Parker, and we want to shout out to um, the Lorraine Hansberry Coalition, who really inspired this. I met Linda Jones through the Westchester Women's Agenda, and uh, she told me about the coalition she founded in Croton, where Lorraine lived and died um, at a very young age. Uh, and so I thought, at some point, here and Lorraine Hansberry Coalition are going to come together, and we did. So um, this whole event is based on Radical Vision by uh, Suika Diggs Colbert, who is a professor at Georgetown, and um, she wrote this uh, piece about Lorraine Hansberry's life. And so these events are built around that book and um, the work and the life and the intersectionality of, of Ms. Hansberry. Um, so we're going to read the bios of these incredible people. I had the honor of seeing um, Baldwin versus Buckley at Cambridge at the Public Theater with my husband. and. When I got up from the seat, I said, what if we can get these amazing people up to Westchester? And I'm like a little, like I'm, I'm shaking right now. <laughs> um, so here they are. Um, and our moderators tonight are going to be Pam from Cure, who holds up the whole fort, um, and Reverend Lane Cobb, who I met, I don't even know how we met, but um, Race Talk Revolution it was and is your uh, platform. Do you want to tell us a little bit about it? No. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, it's a it's a beautiful platform for conversations about uh, race. A very calling in platform. Um, so okay. So our amazing guests. Um, would you want to sure. I'm going to okay. um, introduce John Collins, um, who founded the Elevator Repair Service in 1991. Since then, he's directed or or co-directed all of the company's productions while also serving as the company's artistic director. Um, ERS productions directed by him include Cab Legs, Room Tone, Gats, The Select, or The Sun Also Rises, The Sound and the Fury, Arguendo, Measure for Measure, and numerous others. He is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, a United States Artists Fellowship, and a Doris Duke Performing Artist Award. Welcome, John. And then we have Mr. Greg Sargent, um, who is one of the conceivers of uh, James Baldwin, Baldwin and Buckley at Cambridge. Um, he played James Baldwin in the production. Uh, he is an actor associated artist of the Obie Award winning Target Margin Theater and a company member of the internationally renowned Obie Award winning theater ensemble Elevator Repair Service. Uh, recent credits include Baldwin and Buckley, um, Measure for Measure, and The Sound and the Fury at the Public Theater, uh, Parable Conference at Brooklyn Academy of Music, um, along with Fondly, Colette Richland, Bonnie Splake. He's worked at New York Theater Workshop. He's worked at the Vershnikov Arts Ensemble. Um, He's done plays like Uncle Vanya, The Dinner Party, The Seagull. I mean, this is this man is unbelievable. Um, and uh, many with Target Margin Theater. Um, and films uh, include, let's see, Help Me Mary and The Bad Infinity. And Mr. Sargent has also been published in American Theater Magazine, having written an article regarding agency and race in the theater. Uh, Greg was a W.E.B. Du Bois Fellow at West Virginia University, where he received his MFA in acting. And April Mathis. Lorraine is played for Lorraine Hansberry in Baldwin and Buckley at Cambridge. She is an Obie Award-winning actor and company member of Elevator Repair Service. 
uh, with Elevated Repair Service. She has appeared in Baldwin and Buckley at Cambridge and the Philadelphia Fringe, Fringe, Fringe Festival. Pardon me, I'm sorry. <laughs> the Sound and the Fury, Fondly, Colette Richland, Measure for Measure at the Public, Everyone's Fine with Virginia Woolf at the Abrams Arts Center, Gats at the Perth Festival, Broadway, August Wilson's The Piano Lesson, Off-Broadway, Help, The Shed, Tony Stone at the Roundabout, Fairview, Lear with Soho Rep, Signature Plays, Funny House of a Negro at Signature Theater, Iowa, Antalia Pneumatica, Playwrights Horizons, wow. Mm -hmm. On the Levy Regional, Most Happy in Concert, Little Bunny Foo Foo, Actors Theater of Louisville, A Streetcar Named Desire at Yale Rep, mm -hmm. Television, credits include The Blacklist, Evil, The Good Fight, New Amsterdam, and a film credits include Black Card, Fugitive Dreams, and Ramona at Midlife. Welcome, April Mathis. Wow. So thank you, first of all, Nicole, for inviting me to be a part of this um, event. You know, I'm in awe of your events, so thank you very much. I appreciate this opportunity. Um, and looking forward to hearing from you guys. Can you each tell us a little, a little bit about yourselves, maybe something that's not on the, <laughs> on the bio. Um, how have you come to have careers in the performing arts and how did you uh, end up in elevator repair service? Yeah, Greg, please start. Um, well, um, I am the son of immigrants. My parents are from Guyana, South America and they moved to the United States for a better life. And I was born in Brooklyn. Um, and my parents were very gung-ho about getting the best education they could for their children. So we moved to an all-white town in Long Island, um, where I quickly learned that things were different for me than the people around me. And I didn't like that. And I started acting out in terrible ways. And my parents were very, very worried about me. And quite by accident, I found the theater, which sort of saved my life. Um, it gave me a voice. Um, it was the, uh, I realized um, people could sit in a theater for two hours to listen to a point of view, that, and I wasn't going to get interrupted. <laughs> and um, <laughs> once I had a, the, a first taste of that, I knew I wanted to devote my life to the theater. And um, that's something that's not in the program, <laughs> um, about me and how I started in this business and how I continue to try to use my art now um, for positive force in the world. I can't top that. <laughs> um, I, got, I got into theater as a kid, like a lot of people do. Um, you know, eventually figured out that I had to do it as a career, even though I tried to convince myself that I should be a lawyer or something, anything else other than a theater person because I'd be better off and I would have been in a lot of ways, but I stuck with it. Uh, came to New York right out of college, um, started trying to make shows uh, with the people I knew and trusted. And that was about being a shy person, I think, or not very ambitious person but it led to the creation of a theater company uh, and uh, you know, in a long history now. Um, mm -hmm. But basically I, I learned how to make work by gathering great people around me, uh, people like these two people. Um, and, uh, and I have been the beneficiary of um, a lot of great work by a lot of wonderfully talented people like Greg and April for 30 years now. Um, but it's, it's, it's what I love. It's, I, I love the collaborative and social part of, of being a theater company. I love that being in the theater forces you always to collaborate and talk and compromise and work with um, people who are not you. Uh, and, um, and I continue to learn a tremendous amount every time I make a show with a, a group of smart, talented people that I'm very lucky to work with. So. That's what keeps me going. Thanks. Um, I'm originally from Texarkana, Texas. Uh, so 
to find myself uh, as a working actor in New York City is just as surprising to me as to anyone I went to school with. <laughs> um, but I was I, I went to UT undergrad as an English major, and uh, that that campus it's a forty acre campus and the liberal arts department is on one end and the performing arts department is on the completely opposite end and they said that was by design to keep us from organizing and like <laughs> coming together and there's like a big engineering and uh, uh, business departments which that that school is known for right in the middle um, so I started doing community theater in Austin Texas um, after going to school to as an English major. And uh, I always thought I'd be a writer, but there was something about, like John was saying, collaborating with people that got me to produce in a way that sitting alone in front of my computer, you know, like you can't hear all the people waiting for you to write the great American novel the way that you have an audience waiting to watch you perform and, and a, a company waiting for you to show up. You know, I always feel like you can't die when you're in a show because that would just be highly unusual. That's like a thing that, that would be really strange for that to happen to that theater company. So like you feel kind of um, essential in a way that uh, performing with a group of people makes you feel. And so I, I moved from Austin to New York and started doing downtown theater. And uh, a lighting designer uh, of a show that I had worked on recommended me to John. Uh, and we, we kind of talk about it in Baldwin Buckley, Cambridge, how Greg and I uh, came to Elevator Repair Service, but it was uh, a production of The Sound and the Fury. And uh, we were asked to uh, come in on that production. And uh, so that, that was my introduction to elevator repair service and you know being someone who wasn't trained as an actor never went to acting school never took anything more than like a like an on-camera class here and there when I got to ERS it reminded me so much of like my own play that I did as a child mm -hmm. like imaginative play it was just like I was handed a copy of the sound and the fury and told to like be verse right now and just start reading. And so, you know, I was like, okay, well, have a couple different su Southern accents. Like, <laughs> I'll just keep trying those and like, you know, uh, they worked. this is a baby, <laughs> this is a horse carriage, this uh, is a bed. And, you know, we were just making elements as we found them and uh, s the untrained, like, like person who has a sense of play kind of took to that in a way that like really jibed with what ERS does. And I didn't know that. I hadn't seen any elevator repair service uh, shows, but that it, it just made a lot of sense. And it was also the funniest, smartest room I was in. Like, I don't even know how much of the text we actually got through because it, <laughs> most of the rehearsal was just inside jokes. <laughs> inside jokes that made me laugh though because I felt like I knew it there. And one person was just laughing so much at one point she said, self nip, like <laughs> nip it in the bud. Like, but that, that's just, that was just kind of like this, like cre yeah. no, that was Tori. Oh, right. Like just like I remember that first rehearsal and everybody just seemed like they were out of Saturday Night Live like in the 70s. Like they just <laughs> all seemed like genius, like humorous, like the smartest and the dumbest room I was in. <laughs> and I was like, you know, the I've I found my people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So um, let's chat about the production of um, Baldwin versus Buckley at Cambridge. And Greg, I know this is personal. This is a personal thing for you. Can you um, tell us first uh, the historical premise of the debate and its topic, and then why and how the company chose to uh, reenact it? Sure. OK, so when the debate, um, the debate happened in February of 1965. Um, in January of 1965, the paperback edition of James Baldwin, Another Country, was being published in England. 
and the publisher of that publishing company wanted to fly James Baldwin from Nice to London to do publicity for the, for the book. And he came up with this brilliant idea to try to get as much press out there as possible. So he set up all of these interviews. Um, he also decided that he was going to call Cambridge University to see if they would host him to talk about the book. Mm -hmm. When the publisher spoke to James Baldwin about the book, um, they refused to um, just have him come there to, to promote the book. Um, but they did like the idea of um, having him participate in the debate with a conservative. But they weren't sure who they were going to get. At first, they wanted Strom Thurmond. <laughs> but they couldn't get Strom Thurmond to debate him. Um, then they wanted Barry Goldwater. Um, and Barry Goldwater wasn't interested. But somebody um, on Barry Goldwater's team um, was very gung-ho about this new conservative, William F. Buckley, who was skiing in Gestad, Switzerland at the time with his good friend James Mason. <laughs> so the publisher called um, William F. Buckley to see if he would come to uh, Cambridge uh, to debate Baldwin. And um, he said yes. So um, uh, when all was decided, they decided that they were going to propose um, a, a question to debate on. And that question was, the American dream is at the expense of the American Negro. So that's the historical um, aspect of, of the debate. Um, the personal part and how we chose to do this was that um, Elevator Repair Service was working on another uh, production, um, The Seagull. And John very graciously um, asked me to be in The Seagull, and he wanted me to play a particular role. And it's a great role, but I never saw myself playing this particular role. And I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I thought about it. And for the first time in my career, I said to John, you know what, John? I think this person would be better in that role than me. I never said that before. And John was like, oh, OK, yeah, I, I can see that. And John was like, well, what would you like to do? And I said, well, well what would I like to do about what? <laughs> I said, well, what would you like to do? And I was like, sorry, John, I don't really understand the question. He goes, Greg, if you had to do something with elevator repair service, what would it be? And I was like, oh, oh my gosh, no one's ever asked me that before. Mm -hmm. So I knew in the back of my mind that um, at some point I wanted to play James Baldwin. My dear friend's father years ago came up to me and said, you know, you should play James Baldwin one day. And that always stuck with me because, you know, I had read Baldwin in college and it was so interesting to me. He was so interesting to me and he was a role model on, in every way. And so I went home and I watched YouTube and um, I watched every interview and um, movie documentary. Uh, and quite by accident, I came about the debate, and I didn't know about the debate before, and I watched the entire debate, and I said to myself, oh my gosh, this could be happening right now. Fundamentally, things haven't changed since 1965. This could be very theatrical. And then I said to myself, I'm gonna have a meeting with John. So I went ahead and discussed the meeting with John. We found the transcript. Um, we arranged to have a meeting of the transcript, we were all on the same page, and we decided that um, we were going to try to make this a go. John said, you know, there's that uh, conference that happens every January. It's called the APAP conference, where theater producers from all over the world come to New York to see shows, to see what they're going to bring back to the theater. Mm -hmm. So John said, I'm going to rent a theater. I'm going to send an email. We're going to do two performances. And we'll just see what happens. I'm like, John, we haven't even had a rehearsal yet. <laughs> and he's like, oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. So we'll just read it. <laughs> we'll just read it. So to make a long story very short, um, we had the two performances. They were a huge success. And um, from, from, from those two performances, we got like five offers, I think, to do the show. 
few at least. A few at least. And um, so we were well on our way. I mean, if I had planned this um, to be greenlit at some point, it would have never have happened. I don't know how this happened. All the stars were aligned. And so we were all set and we were working on it and then COVID happened. And um, by the time COVID happened, we, we already had a, um, a firm date in um, May of 2020 to perform at the public. So of course that show was canceled along with so many other shows, but um, we persevered and we kept going and we're reaping the, the, the fruit off the trees from that mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. So, so I have one quick question. What was, do you know, was, is this documented what Baldwin's reaction was to, hey, we don't want to interview about your book. We want you to debate this conservative. Like, what, how did I he think, feel about that? Um, you know, uh, when we were doing the research, we found out that the book about the debate uh-huh. had just come out. It was about Baldwin and Buckley and the debate. Mm. That's where we found the transcript. Okay. Um, I think that Baldwin was very sort of like gung-ho. Oh, okay. He was not like, Frightened off by that okay. at all, so. And he was a bit of a celebrity already then, yeah. and in in Europe especially, I think. So he was, it was it was really Buckley who was kind of set up to fail in that debate. Okay, right, um, and he yeah, and James and, won. And, and I think right. Baldwin was the reason yeah. that there were seven hundred people packed into the Cambridge Union for yeah. that debate. Like the 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 BBC film of it is amazing to watch because. There's not a square inch of floor in that room that's left. Yeah. They packed people in. They were sitting on the floor. They were, they were, yeah. you know, up the walls. They were everywhere. And I think it was but mostly because of Baldwin was, was such an exciting personality already yeah. then for people. I'm also curious just to show of hands, like how many audience members knew of that debate? Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Because I, I, I didn't. And when I watched it, I was like, where was this all my life? Like, <laughs> <laughs> there's so many things, you know, about Okay, um, sorry. So, oh yeah, so April, in the final scene of this piece, so this was, the transcript was the debate, basically, that was the play. Mm -hmm. Um, But then I didn't expect to find you as Lorraine Hansberry, uh, just, you know, showing up after in your, I guess, room, your parlor or wherever um, with James Baldwin. so, and then you, you, so you have this conversation and then you morph into yourselves. So you go from James and Lorraine to um, Greg and April. So my question is why that scene? How did you write it? And then why did you morph into yourselves? Well, you know, when they were talking about the, the first iteration of this, that was this couple performances, huge success at APAP and all these people are interested in it. That was before this moment. And I was one of these people that was like, wait, you're doing what? (laughs) What? Uh, That there was going to be a piece with elevator repair service built around Greg. And that was like primarily dealing with like this black artist. I was like, well, you know who James was friends with? (laughs) Uh, Lorraine Hansberry, just saying. (laughs) Maybe there's an opportunity there. And uh, I just kind of, insinuated myself into the project being like, you can't keep this from me. I will be in the room. I will be a consultant. I will be present. And so, you know, the day we found out that Tom Hanks had contracted COVID in Australia or New Zealand or wherever wherever he was, and it was like, this is a thing, this coronavirus. We were all sitting together in Greg's apartment reading through it mm. and thinking of bringing on like the other people to be involved to play uh, the the moderators and uh, through the course of like the pandemic and like touching this again um, I had kind of thrown out kind of half joking about Lorraine Hansberry but uh, I think you good idea you took me up <laughs> on it because what they were wanting to do was the way the debate ends historically is uh, Buckley gets the last word and then they you know, come together and they decide, uh, they tally the votes and James wins hands down. Uh, but John didn't want to end the piece with the words of William F. Buckley ringing in the audience's ears. So he was trying to conceive of a way that uh, we could uh, 
stay with James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. And so I had thrown out the idea of like, you know, there's something, this is a great showcase for this actor, like you heard the resume, like this is a veteran actor of the New York downtown theater scene. And uh, I was like, can we just have a moment to lift up Greg, Greg Sargent? Like, let's just have a moment to look at him on stage. Uh, and so kind of spitballing off that idea to like have a moment of James Baldwin, the man in repose, like, He's a celebrity. Who is he when he's, you know, off the court, so to speak? Who, you know, he's this, uh, you know, legend in uh, American intellectual thought. Uh, who is he when he's by himself? And so that became uh, maybe he's thinking about. Um, we also found out that Lorraine Hansberry had died earlier that year. A month before the actual debate. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. So this moment was like a memory of the times where they used to spend time together, you know, and would like drink each other under the table and gossip. Right. And, you know, Greg and I have been friends since we met uh, working on The Sound and the Fury with Elevator Repair Service. So. The idea of morphing in and out was like, um, not to compare ourselves with like Lorraine Hansberry no, and James Baldwin, but I mean, because, because yeah. no. we did what they did. Yes, yes, but we I, do what yes, did. yes. Well, and I feel like they would love us. <laughs> uh, but but the idea was, you know, how how can we have this uh, this relationship? And, and get more of like James the human and by extension, Lorraine the human. And uh, so that was kind of how we uh, got to the, the device of having the, the kind of coda epilogue. And you know, what's great about ERS is that we don't have to have a and now we're going to explain to you that we're going into James's mind. It's just kind of like it can be, mm -hmm. it can be out of time. It doesn't have to be that I'm a ghost or whatever. You know, like it can just, it can just exist on its mm -hmm. own. And at one point, there was a thought that maybe it would end with us having a dance party and getting up. You know, um, but uh, it, at one point. We, we, we had a lot of different ideas for the, for the text of that. And uh, sometimes the improv would be like you and I just kind of doing some theater gossiping. <laughs> and what, what it turned into was uh, kind of folding in, what'd you say? <laughs> Almost a lawsuit. <laughs> yeah, well, they, it, we, we kind of got out of that into like actually, you know, talking about ourselves and kind of like, um, calling out, calling in mm. elevator repair service yeah. for cons like the, 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 the origin story of our involvement is elevator repair service at that point existing as an all white theater company and doing the sound and the fury with no black people involved mm -hmm. and then being like, Oh, it's kind of problematic. And then, you know, like calling in some folks who were black and us being two of them. And uh, um, that's, that's we, we, we transparently talk about that as ourselves in that part of the, of the, sh of the show. And so that's us kind of folding out and then folding back in to where we start using language taken from different interviews and speeches that Lorraine and uh, Jimmy gave that could also, is it us talking at that point or is it Jimmy and Lorraine mm -hmm. talking? Mm -hmm. Because it, it could be the same conversation. Mm -hmm. It was so satisfying for me and I felt like I was the, <clears throat> you know, maybe undeserving beneficiary of, of the fact that I had these two people in the room working out the, you know, we were trying to solve a problem basically of like, how do we end this show? 
uh, that if we just do the transcript of the debate and we don't rearrange it, which we thought about doing, but it just didn't work, we can't end it with Buckley's words, you know, and, and his last words are a little scary. They're almost like a call for a race war or something. It's a little, it's intense, and I did not want the audience leaving the theater with that in their heads, like Rich said. Um, but to have the two of them, and it didn't take us that long, really. I mean, we you had like two or three days to work this out, I remember, when we were first working on it, and they, mm. they found something that did <coughs> what I couldn't have thought of on my own, but that still satisfied something I really wanted for the show, which was that it felt right now. <clears throat> it felt immediate, it felt real. You know, the, the, t the text of the 1965 debate, we all thought was text that needed to be heard right now. Yep. And this was in 2019. <clears throat> and then as the next few years passed, that only got more urgent. Um, but they found a way to bring themselves to it, which was a way of bringing the whole play to whatever day and time we were doing it, mm -hmm. and to, to yank it right out of 1965, which is, you know, even though that's where it comes <coughs> from, I wanted it to live in 2021, 2022, 2023, and, and, there, and they very organically found this moment of, uh, you know, linking it all back to how they came to ERS and 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 calling us out in that way, and which 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 felt, you know, was humbling. Obviously, uh, it's a radical move. <laughs> yeah. but, but it also felt just felt so right. It felt right. It felt like we should not be <clears throat> doing this with no self consciousness. We should not be do you know. I, as the, the white guy directing it, should not be, you know, it should not get to cruise through in some righteous way without some acknowledgement of who's, who else is involved with this, who, what company is doing this. And that felt, that felt, that felt right. It didn't well, always feel good, but it felt right. <laughs> well, it was funny because, you know, like we were just in rehearsal and somehow we found our way to that conversation. I was like, you know, this is really, I, I kind of wish we would just say this. Yeah. And that's what happened. Mm -hmm. So it was great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was really watching. It was refreshing. Um, Lane, you know what? What I'm what I'm present to so much in in listening to Salika Diggs Colbert's book and um, going back and looking at the original debate, um, the the courage and the resilience of those two people in particular. But our civil rights icons, um, in in general, and just what it must have taken to be those two people, mm -hmm. and so I'm wondering what it was like for you two to portray those people, but also that uh, Soika <coughs> Dix Colbert talks about um, Lorraine Hansberry using her writing and her plays as a witness to the lived experience of African Americans. And I'm wondering what you felt about that and the significance of having so many of her plays right now um, in revival. What, like, why is her work so still important? What is the, was it like for you, and why is that work so important still today? OK. Oh. Well, I mean, to answer the first part of your question, um, uh, when we first started working on this, um, James Baldwin gave his last interview to uh, a man named Quincy Troop. Quincy Troop was the biographer for Miles Davis. Um, and he wrote the last interview a month before Baldwin died. And in, um, so we decided that we were gonna meet with Quincy Troop to ask, uh, Quincy Troop to ask him questions about James Baldwin. And one of the things he said about James Baldwin is, even though that he was 5'6 and 130 pounds, he was one of the meanest, toughest motherfuckers you ever met. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> That's a quote. Um, and I always, I really sort of hung on to that the whole time because, I mean, basically, um, his whole life, um, he, he stuck by his principles and his beliefs and was totally unafraid 
Um, and I learned from that so much as a human being, as an actor, as a performer, as a you know budding activist, um, that that strength that he had, that that you know willing to do what other people weren't willing, who they couldn't do it, and and, and moving forward. Unapologetic. Unapologetic. Um, in terms of witness, you know, you need to have people see this in this time um, uh, for the confirmation of what you're trying to do to keep going. It's, you know, for me, that was a strong, strong thing. I mean, I, when I read Baldwin and Lorraine Hansberry and listen to the interviews, there's an intelligence that's just so clear it's like none of this is really a mystery and um, none of it is new. And one of the favorite things I, I loved from an exchange that they had that I was like, this has to be in here. It's like, um, what makes you think that I would want to be integrated into this? Meaning like American society writ large, maybe something else. It's like, <laughs> Uh, what's that quote about, uh, yeah, well, why would I want to be invited into a burning house? What's the expression about the burning house? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. But yes, yes. And uh, uh, <clears throat> there's just something, I think, I forget who I was talking about this with, but it's, it's also not new, this idea of like, am I crazy or did that just happen? It's like, I'm not crazy. And to me, that's what the witnessing is. It's mm -hmm. like, let's call this out. Let's recognize this. Let's not say that this is all in my mind. Like, you know, being from where I'm from, Texarkana, there's, you know, growing up in my family, there was always like, okay, is this shop owner an asshole or are they racist? They're probably racist. You know, um, but uh, there's, it's very interesting that in this country, you know, people are still trying to not talk about slavery mm -hmm. and, and take it out of the textbooks mm -hmm. and uh, take it out of the discourse and um, act like the ground we're sitting on isn't stolen. So um, to me, witnessing is all about naming things, telling the truth about things, um, uh, talking about race and blackness and whiteness uh, very openly and clearly. And that's the thing. It's just, um, I think intelligence is not just about are we all familiar with this canon of literature? But it's a it's a kind of social intelligence about are we are we all seeing the same thing and can we name it? I just wanted that word crazy. Like I think I think that the the so much of the crux of all this to me because I started my journey in this with like reading Ta-Nehisi Coates and like our current thinkers, mm -hmm. thought leaders in the black community. And then I went back and read Baldwin, which I'd never read before. And um, I was like, but he was saying it already, you know, like, <laughs> idiot. I mean, I'm sorry, you know, but, but, but so I think the cre th that word crazy just, it resonates with me all the time because it's like, we have yet to say and talk about what we need to talk about. And you say Buckley ended with a, a call for a race war, but we could turn on the news right now and see that. Yeah, that we can read an article in anything mm -hmm. that's on the internet and, and there's a call mm -hmm. for a race war. Mm -hmm. And that is like, we just can't cop to it. And it's not about like, let's line everybody up and blame them. Mm -hmm. It's like, let's heal this already, you know? And mm -hmm. I think that's like why your this play, this reenactment, and then you sitting there on that sofa together is like, and here we are, you know, mm -hmm. and here we are. And so I just want to, can we get to the radical question? I think that might be your question, but I, we're, we're, 
I, I could sing her the right. Right. Um, mm-hmm. um, well, her quote. Well, her quote, right? And I, oh, I, yeah, that's about, yeah. Right, I love that that came up, that about, you know, her, how she says mm-hmm. to um, Jimmy at about the end, white about liberals. white liberals mm-hmm. becoming radical. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? What does the that last mean? line of the play. Right, yeah. what does that mean yeah. to all of you individually? What, is, what does a white liberal becoming a radical mean? Because radical is such a scary word. You know, well, not, white but... liberal is a scary word as well. I mean, it's all, it's all good to be well-meaning, but it's sort of like, I think um, in the book, it's, she puts it like it's a cruel optimism because um, the white liberal and the racist are drawn from the same piece of material. So they understand each other. The difference between the two of them is um, consciousness and education. One is more conscious and more educated, and one is more sympathetic than the other. But they're still the same. We need somebody who um, is going to fight the fight, who's going to take the action in spite of of the consequences. And, you know, I made a joke a little earlier, like that little ending scene to me is a very radical move. Um, when we talk about how we started in, in, in this theater company, you know, we were dealing with the most extraordinary white liberals there were. <laughs> but just the fact that the act of having this scene was a very, the, the white liberals became white radicals in that particular moment mm. because they called themselves out and shared it with other people. Mm. And by doing that, it continued the conversation, which was our hope for this piece. Um, we brought this piece to a whole new audience to continue the conversation for hope in the future. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a, a fascinating and and righteously provocative argument about the white liberals and the white racists being cut from the same cloth. And, I, and the way that I, under, one way that I understand that and the way that I understand Hansbury's, you know, call is that because white people have such a hard time and will always have a hard time understanding the depths of their privilege understanding what that really means and and how many tiny corners of their lives it affects. Um, so that whether it's 1965 or right now, you, you cannot, um, there, there is a, there is a, a, a depth of, of investigation and questioning that will, Whatever you can achieve in your life that way is never going to be enough. Um, and and I, what, what resonates with me about that that comparison, although startling as it is, it's about these. Whether it's the educated and conscious white liberal or the uneducated and not conscious white racist, and sometimes they're educated and conscious white racist too. Obviously, um, maybe in some ways the even bigger problem. Um, they're always dealing with their own comfort, right? And I think for, for and, I, and the way I understand what Hansbury says there is that, you know, and, and relate to, is that the white liberal has found a kind of comfort, has found a way to deal with that consciousness and that education and be comfortable and find, you know, just the right threshold for that comfort. And for the for the white liberal, it's like saying the right thing, you know, showing up in the right way. But it doesn't. But it's not enough. And in fact, it can be corrosive in that way because of that kind of comfort that can come from being a good white liberal. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, I think that, you know, I think about that every time I hear it. And I and I'm you know and I. It's meaningful to me that it is the last thing that we say in that show, because it's forward-looking, um, and it and it's a maybe a subtle way of, of of suggesting that we don't feel necessarily forgiven or comfortable for having done this show. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it's it. You know, I did it. 
I did it for Greg, and I did it, you know, and I was happy to let him take the lead on this, and, and likewise with that final scene, to let these two great artists take the lead on that. But there, there will never be enough that an individual can do. So in, in some ways, radicalism is the only feasible option that way, and, and there are a whole bunch of different ways to understand that, but, but maybe most importantly is to understand that your comfort is not enough. You know, finding, you know, a comfortable, you know, gratifying, uh, you know, righteousness about your opinions is not enough. Mm -hmm. And, and if you can't do anything else, you at least have to know that. Well, radicalism is disruptive, and it's going to shake the foundations of our founding fathers and everything that we've been made to believe about these United States. And it's, it's uncomfortable for everyone who, uh, is grown, who grows up and is indoctrinated in this this white supremacist version of what this country is and is built on. And it's gonna be uncomfortable. It's gonna be messy and we're gonna have to divorce ourselves and disabuse ourselves of a lot of things. And uh, there are folks who don't want that. And there are like white liberals who say um, only so much, okay? Okay, guys, just wait or you know, not this way, you know, nice. or it, it has to look like this, or, you know, but really, I still want my kids to go to this kind of school, you know, like, um, and it, it, it takes uh, not only getting rid of comfort, but like flipping over some tables and like, you know, putting yourself like John Brown on the line for some folks to be like, um, this is, this, this is my problem. I'm gonna really take this on, um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 not comfortable. Mm -hmm. But also, it, you know, there's so much. If we stop and think for a minute about what we were talking about, about the courage of Lorraine Hansberry and James Baldwin, if you could even begin to conceive of what that courage really was, like what that really meant, like no you know, comfortable, educated, liberal white person should have anything to fear about being a radical if these two could so fearlessly do what they did. You know, I mean, that, 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 that courage should be inspiring to everyone, I think. I think about when they were meeting, what was it, LBJ? Yeah. And, uh, you know, they, they have this meeting and... Uh, oh, oh, Robert Kennedy. Oh, we know it was Kennedy, yeah. yeah right. Right. And uh, there is a young activist from like the South. And, you know, Kennedy has gathered all these like black intellectuals to talk. And Lorraine was like, you need to be talking to him. That's who I'm listening to. Mm -hmm. Like this young guy who just came from whatever protest, mm -hmm. like that's, that's who I'm taking my marching orders from. And that's what she was doing even when she was sick at the end of her life. Um, and uh, that's, you know, I'm, I'm finding that with, with my, my Gen Z children, siblings, <laughs> who are like making me, you know, who grew up in the 90s with Benetton and like Cosby Show. They're making me <laughs> go like, oh, huh, I'm, I gotta sit with myself. Oh, I gotta, all, all right. Uh, yeah, I, I got some stuff in me that I need to get rid of. So, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, it almost is time to take questions. Gabby's like, if I move to the back of the room, it means it's time to take questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just want to make sure we, before we do, that we're not missing something. I mean, I, you I mean, have said so much more than we could have actually yeah. ever hoped for, so I think we're okay. Is there a burning question that any of us want to read off of our script, or should we move to our amazing people who showed up tonight? I think we should move to the amazing okay. people. The amazing people who showed up tonight. Okay, okay. Anyone have questions for these incredible folks? You know I do. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yes, yes. He's not a plant. He's not a plant. Yes, yes. No, you have oh. to. Yeah, you do. Thank you. Um, well, this has been excellent, and thank you guys for just everything that you've done leading up to this. Um, your discussion of the white liberal and the quote um, reminds me of what Martin Luther King said about his concern about the white moderate, which is very similar to what you said, you know, wait another day, just one more day, just one more. And he's like, no, the moment is today. So my question for you guys, uh, for all three of you is, uh, what is something that, what is a quote that they had when you listened to their discussions? What's something that resonated with you? What's something that you turn over every once in a while, like, oh my God, that was, that might change the way I do something. That might change the way I act or think of something. This, the way that you said even your Gen Zs have you questioning like, oh yeah, uh, what exactly was my role in that? So what, what's a good quote that really stuck with you? A one line or a sound bite, anything like that? Well, I mean, in my particular speech is James Baldwin. I mean, it's filled with so many things. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's, that, it, there's the famous line, um, you know, I picked the cotton mm -hmm. and I carried it to market and I built the railroads under someone else's whip for nothing, for nothing. And every time I hear that line and every time I say that line, and I feel the anger that boils up inside of me and trying to really sit with myself and ask myself, how can I move on from this in a productive way? How can I talk to the people and teach the people so that this feeling of worthlessness subsides in some way for the future? So that's my one line. Well, the, the whole thing about what makes you think um, I would want to be um, uh, invited or indoctrinated or accepted into, into this, uh, accepted. Um, it's, you know, I, I think of like the whole thing of you gain the, what profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul. Um, it's about, <laughs> it makes me question the pursuit of, uh, capitalism and, uh, you know, commercial success as an actor. Um, it makes me question the American dream and, um, like what kinds of roles and jobs I want to get and to what end, um, you know, it's like. The Oscars are coming up. Everybody wants an Oscar. Everybody wants to, you know, and, and, and then what exactly? To, to have the house and do what exactly? Um, when there is so much suffering going on, like, across the street, you know, mm -hmm. um, literally in your own town, you can find folks that are suffering. And... Um, uh, while it seems like the easiest thing to do is just get my own money and try to be a philanthropist, you know, like it's it 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 that there's something in there that that feels like that's not it. That's not it. It ha it has to be um, like what what am I doing uh, for for the people which I'm a part of. Mm. I mean, uh, I would, I have to echo uh, what Greg said about his line about, you know, I picked the cotton, I carried it to market, uh, I built the railroads under someone else's whip for nothing. There is a, that is such an incredible peak in Greg's speech as Baldwin is part of the debate. Um, and, and it's one of the lines that I, I look forward to hearing every time I listen to the show because 
I feel like it is such a punch in the face of education. It is, it is explaining to you, the listener, what really happened. And there's a, there's a reciprocal part of the show, which is the unpleasant response to that, that, um, that William F. Buckley Jr. has, which is to say, well, my great grandparents worked too. You know, nothing was ever achieved without some amount of work. And it is this profound misunderstanding of what Baldwin is saying. And, and, the, and it is a profound misunderstanding of the profound history lesson that comes from that statement. And, and the reason why that awful response also resonates with me is because it sounds so familiar. Yeah. Is because it sounds like the way people now deny structural and systemic racism because they want to say, well, everything's fine now. I mean, even like in the Supreme Court, you know, justice is saying like, well, we don't need that. We don't need that, those laws anymore because everything's fine now. You know, the constant denial that these problems have taken such deep root and they are still poisoning society and yet people will say like, no, 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 everything's fine. You know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, whatever. Um, so that's, that is a kind of education I look forward to every time I listen to the show. Well, and in Hansberry's life too, right? She was an unapologetic Marxist and, mm -hmm. and really lived lean and really was on the ground with people mm -hmm. who are activists and, um, it's interesting that when she wrote Raisin and was was shown to the world as a beautiful housewife who wrote a great play, um, all that depth, you know, was sort of dismissed. And and actually, the I think the first ending of Raisin was that they were armed. armed. So the the in, younger in family the new, the moves to the white neighborhood. Yeah shut their doors mm -hmm. and take they take up arms. Yeah. And of course that wasn't the Broadway production, mm -hmm. right? Cause mm -hmm. that would have been, you know. So I think um, there's a lot to be said for uh, the isms, right? Like, <laughs> and, and, and why can't we create new ones? Mm -hmm. um, any other questions out there? Um, <laughs> no, 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 no question. I know there's questions. <laughs> that in a time that we thought was even more constricted than we are now, there was still a space for a, a voice and an intellect like Baldwin. And clearly there are people among us now who, who, who have that kind of intellect and speak truth, and yet they are so completely vilified, there's really no one I can think of in our public life that is being lifted up and listened to the way that Baldwin was allowed a voice. And um, I mean, I don't know exactly how to formulate the question, but as people who've been really looking at during that time how Hansberry and Baldwin, despite what was going on, were given that that platform and given an ear and given the space to to express themselves. Can you reflect a little bit about how we can create more space for because there there are brilliant people among us now with a voice, right? <laughs> they were a product of their environment and took yeah. and took the lead and had the, the difficult conversations. They were not given anything. And I think we have to do the same thing. You know, in, a, in 2023, we're still, there's still systemic racism. There's still issues with voting. There's still um, housing discrimination. Um, there are still people that are disenfranchised. We have to take that back. And if we really want to make a change, we have to do something about that. There we are, have to do that. There are lots of writers and thinkers that are out there. In fact, I'd say that there's too many to name. And mm. uh, I think it's it speaks to where media is today. Like there's not one channel to watch 
There's not one news outlet to read. Um, there's not one like black political intellectual, um, you know, conscious voice to listen to. There are many, and I don't think they always agree with each other. And I think uh, people speak to different communities. Um, and you know, I've heard the same kind of question about like, you know, well, in the civil rights era, we had leaders, where's our leader? And I think people now are questioning those hierarchies and like that kind of belief that there needs to be this one voice and this one way, and we all fall in line under this one voice. I mean, you know, um, there are just so many organizations and folks that are working in tandem. There are great thinkers and writers like Soyika um, and uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates and, uh, um, you know, all these great books like, like the, uh, 1619 Project, uh, you know, um, uh, the new Jim Crow, like there, there's a lot of thought out there. It's just, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think it, it, it has to be one voice and, and one particular way. I mean, on the other side, you see, you saw like people rally around Trump and like a few a handful of, of slogans. And so maybe there's this idea that there's a power behind kind of dumbing down and centralizing like, you know, um, make this like this or whatever. But I, yeah, you know, but I, I, I don't know. I think there's a groundswell that comes from many different directions. And I, I, I feel the movement, which I think is what scares the the monolith, mm -hmm. and why they're pulling out all the stops to try to stop this, because 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 things are happening. Mm -hmm. We are having the conversation that that we said we didn't want to have, or some of us said we didn't want to have. It's always hard to compare a, a historical view of something when we have that much distance <clears throat> to what's happening right now, and I think that maybe what's incumbent upon us now is to not try to imagine, you know, a sort of glorious historical moment, which we see in these two, you know what I mean? Like, and, and, uh, and how inspiring they were and how singular, um, you know, we don't know, there, there, there's, there's no way to write the history of right now, right now. It gets written later. So, uh, and maybe when it does, there, people will be able to see that there was great clarity uh, in, in places now that it, it's harder for us to see. I think what we see more and more right now is just the, the fearful reaction to progress. Um, and so I, I, I think it, you know, it's an interesting question, but it does kind of drive us back to, you know, what we have to do individually. Um, and, and it's also like historically obvious every every time there is movement, right? There's retrenchment. It just, yeah. you can look at it throughout history. Yeah. So freedom comes up a lot in, hmm. in, um, in Colbert's book. And um, my, our question we have about like 10 minutes um, is what does freedom mean to each of you and what is your freedom practice? Because I think Hansberry had one. Um, she was always at work. She was always writing. She was always encountering. She was always debating. Um, and so I guess that's for the three of you. What is freedom to you? And what is your freedom practice? <laughs> What's your <laughs> freedom like, what practice, that Greg? Uh, well, <laughs> well you know what practice? my freedom practice is. But freedom to me, <laughs> freedom to me in this lifetime would be just to be left alone. Mm -hmm. not, to be, not to be bothered. Um, and I'll, I'll explain more about that in a second. My freedom practice is every year I go to France for two weeks. 
why did I go to France for two weeks? There's racism in France. But when I go there, I'm not the number one on the racism list. <laughs> and so it's like I'm taking a oh vacation from racism. I don't have to worry about, can I go to this restaurant? Who's in this restaurant? Why are they looking at me like this? I can just go there and be and do and experience and live life the way that I was meant to live it. That's my freedom practice. It's funny that you <laughs> to be left alone, because I, I said that too in my head to myself when I was thinking about these questions. And then I was like, well, how can I define it not in a, like in a, in a positive way and not say the absence of something? But um, I think what I came up with is just like, freedom to me is, um, to be able to go in whatever direction I want to go, be that like, you know, Tanzania or like 125th Street or Texarkana or wherever it is I want to go and unrestricted movement, mm. but also to be find exactly where I am. Like someone said something recently about like how we understand gravity is not just this force pulling us down, but it's also like the force of the earth kind of rising up to meet us. And so there's actually like something in uh, um, physics or, or, you know, the, the, these laws that there is a kind of like springing up. And to me, I just thought about that and it made me think about um, just being okay where I am too. Uh, so I can go all over the world or the entire world can come to me. Um, and that I, that I have everything I need no matter where I am. That, that feels toward, toward freedom. And as far as a, a freedom practice, uh, I think it's it's it what it looks like is staying open, um, open to new ideas, uh, open to new possibilities, uh, uh, and then offering that to people around me, not to be stuck in any kind of like. Uh, hierarchy or, or um, institutions to be able to move laterally and multidimensionally uh, and uh, to, to be able to say no to, to things that, that, that don't make sense. Um, and um, yeah, just really um, within my purview, like making choices that that feel aligned with uh, what I think is like a decent way to be a person and then also staying open to, to new ways to, to showing up. Um, that's a complicated question for me because uh, for, I also grew up in the South and, uh, and was very lucky to have um, parents and family who, uh, encouraged me or gave me the freedom to want something else, to want to get out. Um, and so for the longest time, my idea of freedom was about intellectual freedom. I wanted to be able to be in a place where, you know, everything that I, when I got to be 13 or 14 and recognized all these things that I thought were terrible about the rural South, which is where I lived, that freedom would be about getting out of that, mm. would be about getting to a place like New York City or an Ivy League university or someplace where, you know, there was great diversity of people in every respect. And, you know, I found that and I got that. And I don't think, so I don't think about freedom that same way anymore because I feel like now, uh, and so much rhetoric around that now from white people especially just is nauseating. You know, you don't want to hear about somebody's freedom to, you know, 
have a gun or not educate their children or, or whatever it is, these, these, all these awful things that the word gets attached to so often now rhetorically. Mm -hmm. So I don't think about it. I, 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 if I had to answer what my practice was that way, it's really just about constantly reminding myself of the freedom I already have. Mm -hmm. Not about something aspirational, but about humility and about consciousness and understanding of all the things that have already been given to me, all the freedoms I already have, and not ever letting myself think that I am somehow underprivileged or that I somehow need more than I have, because that's, that isn't going to help the world in any way. It's not going to help me either. So I, I don't, you know, it's a complicated, complicated thing to think about, but it takes me there, just to humility. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for answering the question because you could have skipped it. <laughs> like, you know what, number five, can we not? <laughs> um, anybody else out there? Oh, oh, wait, good, yay. Thank you. Is this on? Yeah, thank you so much for this um, really interesting conversation. Um, so, you know, Hansberry and Baldwin both use their art and their voice in service of political engagement and freedom struggles. And I'm just wondering if the two of you as artists in playing these roles um, came to learn or think anything different about your own art and either politics or um, freedom. Um, go, go, you, you speak. Um, uh, yeah, I feel I'm a braver artist now. Um, throughout, throughout all the research that I did to play James Baldwin, and I saw his inner strength and his struggles and his background and how he got to where he got, I feel a little less poor me. <sighs> and a lot more like, I have only have such a short time left on this earth. I'm going to try to do the best I can as an artist to make a difference about things that really matter. So. What I was just going to say about Lorraine Hansberry is uh, through this project, I learned more about her identity as a queer woman, which I think growing up with Lorraine Hansberry and, and loving, you know, A Raisin in the Sun and like dying to play uh, Benita, I'm <laughs> like, still, please, so I can play Benita. Um, like, I just, I was not aware of that part of her. And, um, you know, part of this research also was like looking into her queer literature under a pseudonym and, um, you know, uh, I've just, uh, it's just kind of opened me up into um, like it, just how queerness and blackness intersect and um, uh, just how comforting that knowledge feels and how interesting that feels, especially as uh, Lorraine was someone who was married to a white man and, like you said, thought of as, uh, in certain contexts, as this, like, you know, nice little straight housewife, um, but uh, was living in Croton, like, as a, as a lesbian, um, and toward, like, what would be the, the end of her life. And so, um, yeah, I've just been thinking about how those identities rhyme and... Um, you know, and in a in a very interesting way, like how a lot of the 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 tension for white folks and well-meaning white folks is this like decentering yourself and not being comfortable and like it's like is the worst part of your day that you're just wrong? Like, is that, is that really it? Um, and seeing that as someone who like, you know, has an affinity for queerness, but does not necessarily like lead, lead in identifying myself as, as a part of the active queer community. Um, 
just being in queer spaces, I go like, it's not that hard. It's not that hard to like be wrong and, you know, fix it or just sit down and be quiet and get out of the way for like seven minutes. Like, can you just have it not be about like, well, I, I tried and I did all this work and so, and I'm still wrong. Well, I guess I just can't say anything. You know, it's just like, just, well, don't say anything then. And so it's okay. Just sit and just be around folks, you know, if they feel like being around, you know, like, so, um, I guess part of the being investigated in this in this part of Lorraine has just kind of like helped me to to sit comfortably with um, yeah like um, just just being more open. Mm. I want to thank thank all of you for such a rich, uh, amazing conversation. One of the things that um, that really struck me as true uh, was uh, something was mentioned about about the white school really being for the whites, by the whites, and about the whites, and not not really being um, sometimes uh, accommodating um, educationally uh, f for uh, for blacks and Hispanics, and and I said to myself, "Yes, that's true," but I but it's hard for me to say exactly how, and 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 why, and 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 how that can be um, brought to light, and and turned around. There's, it's also it was said that that uh, that education is helpful, uh, which is also true. But those two contradict each other, and so they, there's there's something there. Um, how how can we how can we shine a light on 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 making the white school what it could be? Is the lycée français, and he's learning French history, and there's a lot of stuff that he's coming home with that uh, is challenging and in a similar way to me of, you know, how he's being taught in certain classes about uh, like dark Africa and all the poverty. And it's like, well, where do you think these European nations got their wealth from? Uh, this very resource rich nation. And uh, there's a, there was a quote floating around on social media during Black History Month that was like, slavery is white history. It's not black history. Uh, so I think when we really investigate what education is, like I was saying, into, for me, intelligence is not like, have you read these particular uh, great white dead men that this particular institution has decided are the great men to have read. Uh, well, this, I had a sister who um, went to Thailand on a Fulbright to teach African American literature as American literature. And so these people who were new to English were taught um, Amiri Baraka, uh, Toni Morrison, uh, uh, Zora Neale Hurston as the English language. So I feel like um, it's not contradictory. I, I feel like there's, we all need to know the origins of this country and that needs to be taught. And I think we all need to know about the contributions of who all be, who gets called American and what that is. And I think that's beneficial to everyone who's, who's on this soil. Thanks for a great panel. Are you planning to collaborate again? 
and do you have anything in development? And if not, you know, what would be the uh, what would be the obstacles in your way, and how could you overcome them? Because we'd love to see more. We're 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 a company that uh, very much values um, the kind of community that we create around our work, and so you know, Greg and April have both worked on many shows uh, with us, and and I'm sure we'll work on many more to come. Um, you know, this is not an official plan of ours, but but you know, the way projects come about sometimes is like one show will sort of suggest another one and this not very long scene at the end of Baldwin and Buffy at Cambridge between these two people, I, as we worked on it, I kept thinking, this could really be its own thing. And I still think about that. I still think about that. Um, what we're, I mean, the, the boring answer to the, que the, the question is that we're working on an adaptation of, of James Joyce's Ulysses right now, um, <laughs> which, um, uh, which uh, April worked on briefly when we first started to work on it and made a great contribution then, but is just too big and famous now to continue with. <laughs> um, but uh, so that's, that's, that's the next thing. I mean, we, we love, you know, tough problems to solve. Um, but uh, you know, I think that I'm serious when I say that, like the the scene at the end of Baldwin and Buckley is material, more. tons of material for more work. Mm -hmm. so. And and Baldwin and Buckley is going to France. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And yeah. we are. And then and Baldwin and Buckley at Cambridge continues to uh, to perform. We are going to Avignon uh, in July, uh, which is exciting. Um, and, and I think great to take that show to France, which was an important place to James Baldwin. And great. And, and great <laughs> More importantly, a very important place. Uh, it's a great um, site. Um, and, uh, and we'll also do the show uh, in, in Berkeley uh, next year as well. Uh, so, and, and, and hopefully more than that, I mean, I. We, we'd like to do it in New York again. We felt like we got a little shortchanged on our run uh, at the public and we, you know, that's the other thing about having a company like this is that the sh we, it's always our ambition for the, each show to live on with the people who made it. So um, this will continue to be a priority. This show will going forward. Well, it's that time. Oh, we do. We do. We have another. Oh, she'll catch I'm sorry, one more. I saw the production. Oh. At the public. And the bravery at the end of the show was phenomenal. Of the two of you being who you are. Yeah. It Ish. was. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm an elevator repair service groupie. I see no. everything you've done. I always thought about how white the company was. <laughs> and that bothered me, actually. <laughs> And I'm curious about the fact that you are the artistic director, have you shifted roles? I mean, I know you all work collaboratively, but what about- He can, it's, it's all him. I, I, <laughs> I, I don't want that job. <laughs> uh, well, we don't, I mean, I, I have always had that role and, and continue to, and I think of it as sort of, uh, in, in part, a sort of necessary sort of structural consistency that I hope allows for a lot of freedom inside it. Uh, you know, it was, it was my privilege and pleasure to be able to hand off the authoring of the concept of this show to Greg. And, and a lot of times it does happen that way where I, I, I'm just there to facilitate the creative input of other people. Um, and so, uh, you know, happy to. Um, Keep keep watching us. You'll you'll be less frustrated by how we are. <laughs> oh, oh, I got. I'm sorry. One more. One more. Sorry. Okay. I'm sorry, and it'll be very quick, and it's a perfect closer, I think. <laughs> um, if you could give from the words that they had, again from their quotes and their thoughts, if you could give marching orders to everyone listening right now, from their words or from what you gleaned from your study of them. Just how, like Buckley ordered a race war, basically, the way that some of our representatives are uh, suggesting a national divorce. Uh -huh. 
in contrast to that, what would you give us as marching orders for the people that are listening right now? Good question. Become an American radical. We'll end this the way we end our show then. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's We're done. Yeah. We're done. <laughs>